the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, connecting with thought leaders all around the world, this is a Cube Conversation. Hello everyone, welcome to the Cube special coverage of the AWS Summit. San Francisco, North America, all over the world, in most of the parts, Asia Pacific, uh, Amazon Summit is the hashtag. This is part of the Cube virtual program where we're going to be covering Amazon Summits throughout the year. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE, and of course, we're not at the events. We're here in the Palo Alto studios with our COVID-19 quarantine crew, and we got a great guest here from AWS, Dave Brown, Vice President of EC2, leads the team on Elastic Compute and its business where it's evolving, and most importantly, what it means for the customers in the industry. Dave, thanks for spending the time to come on the CUBE virtual program. Hey, John, it's really great to be here. Thanks for having me. So we got the summit going down. It's it's new format because of the shelter in place. They're going virtual, virtual or digital, uh, virtual virtualization of events. And I want to uh, have a session with you on EC2 and some of the new things that are going on. But I think the story is important because um, certainly around the pandemic and certainly around the large scale SaaS business models, which are turning out to be quite the impact from a positive standpoint uh, with people sheltering in place, is the role of data in all this. Okay, and also, there's a lot of pressure financially. We've had uh, the, the payroll loan programs from the government and to companies really looking at their bottom line. So two major highlights going on in the world that's directly impacted. And you have some products and news around this. And I want to do a deep dive on that. One is AppFlow, which is a new integration service by AWS that really talks about taking the scale and value of AWS services and integrating that with SaaS applications and the migration acceleration program for Windows, which is uh, has a story history with AWS for many, many years. You guys have been yeah. powering most of the Windows workloads. Ironic that you guys are not at Microsoft, but certainly had success there. <laughs> Let's start with the app flow. Okay, this was recently announced on the 22nd of April. This is a new service. Can you take us through why this is important? What is the service? Why now? What was the main driver behind app flow? Yeah, absolutely. So, so with the launch of AppFlow, what we're really trying to do is make it easy for organizations and enterprises to really control the flow of their data um, between the number of different applications that they use uh, on-premise um, and AWS. And so the problem we started to see was um, enterprises just had this data all over the place and they wanted to do something useful with it. Um, right? We've seen many organizations running data lakes, large-scale analytics, um, big machine learning on AWS, uh, but before you can do all of that, you have to have access to the data. And if that data is sitting in an application, um, either on premise or elsewhere in AWS, it's very difficult to get out of that application and into S3 or Redshift or one of those services before you can manipulate it. That was the challenge. And so uh, the, the journey kind of started a few years ago. Um, we actually launched a service on the EC2 networking side called PrivateLink. Uh, and it was really, it provided uh, organizations with a, a very secure way to transfer network data um, both between VPCs and also between VPC and on-prem networks. And um, what this highlighted to us is organizations say, that's great, but I actually, I don't have the technical ability or the team to actually do the work that's required to transform the data from whether it's uh, Salesforce uh, or SAP um, and, and actually move it over private link to AWS. And so we realized, well, private link was useful. We needed another layer of service that actually provided this. And one of the key requirements was an organization must be able to do this with no code at all. So basically no developer required, um, and I want to be able to transfer data from Salesforce, my Salesforce database, and put that in Redshift together with some other data and then perform some function on that. And so that's what AppFlow is all about. And so we came up with the idea about a little bit more than a year ago. Uh, it was the first time I sat down and actually reviewed the content for what this was going to be. Uh, and the team's been hard at work and launched on the 22nd of April. Um, and we actually launched with 14 partners as well um, that provide what we call Connect. Um, which allow us to access um, these various services. And so it's companies like Salesforce and ServiceNow, Slack, Snowflake, um, to name a few. Well, certainly you guys have a great ecosystem of SaaS partners and that's you know well-documented in the industry that you guys are not going to be competing directly with a lot of these big SaaS players, although you do have a few services for customers who want end-to-end. -end. You know, Jassy continues to pound that home on my CUBE interviews. But I think this is Absolutely. notable and I want to get your thoughts on this because this seems to be the key unlocking of the value of SaaS and cloud because data traversal, data transfer, there's costs involved. Also tra moving traffic around over the internet is unsecure and unreliable. So I want a couple questions I want to just ask you directly. One is, did the app flow come out of the AWS private link piece of it? Um, and two, is it one directional or bi-directional? How is that working? Because I'm guessing that you had private link became successful because no one wants to move on the internet. Um, they want to have direct connects. 
Was it was there something inadequate about that service? Was there more headroom there? And is is it bi-directional for the customer? Uh, so, so let me take the second one. It's absolutely bi-directional. So you can transfer that data between an on-premise application and AWS or AWS and the on-premise application. Um, really anything that has a connector um, can support the data flow in both directions. Um, and with transformations. Um, so you know, data um, in one data source may need to be transformed before it's actually useful in a second data source. And so Appflow takes care of all that transformation as well um, in both directions. Um, and again, with, with no requirement for any code um, on behalf of the customer. Um, which really unlocks it, you know, for a lot of the sort of the, the more business focused um, parts of an organization who maybe don't have immediate access to developers, um, they can use it immediately, just literally with a few a few transformations via the console and, and, and it's working for you. Um, in terms of, you know, the, you mentioned sort of the flow of data over the internet and the, the need for security of data, um, it, it's critically important. And, you know, as we look at uh, just what Amazon as, as a company does, you know, right, we have very, very strict requirements around the flow of data um, and what services we can use internally and, and where's any of our data going to be going. And I think it's a good example of how many enterprises are thinking about data today. Um, they do not want to be, um, you know, they, they don't even want to trust human HTTPS and encryption of data on the internet. I'd rather just be in a world where my data never ever traverses the internet and I just never have to deal with that. And so, you know, the, the journey all started with private link there. Um, and Private link was an interesting feature because it really was a change in the way that we asked our customers to think about networking. Nothing like private link has ever existed in the sort of st standard networking you know, that an enterprise would normally have. It's kind of only possible because of what VPC allows you to do and what the software defined network on AWS gives you. And so we built private link. And uh, as I said, you know, it, it customers started to adopt it. They loved the idea of um, being able to transfer data either between VPCs or between on-premise or between their, their own VPC and maybe a third party provider like Snowflake has been a very big adopter of private link and they have many customers using it to get access to Snowflake databases in a very secure way. Um, and so, so that's where it all started. And you know, in those discussions with customers, we started to see that they, they, wanted, to, they wanted us to up level it a little bit. They said, we can use private link, it's great, but one of the problems we have is just a flow of data. Yeah. And how do we flip, you know, move data in a very secure, in a, in a highly available way um, with no sort of bottlenecks in the system. Yeah. And so we thought private link was a great sort of underlying technology that empowered all of this, but we had to build the system on top of that, which is AppFlow yeah. um, that says we're going to take care of all the complexity. And, and then we had to go out to the ecosystem and say to all these providers, um, can you guys build connectors? Um, because we, you know, everybody realizes it's super important that data can be shared. Um, and so that, that organizations can really extract the value from that data. Um, and so they, you know, the 14 of them at launch, and we have many, many more coming down the road. Um, have come to the body with, with connectors and full support for what AppFlow um, provides. Yeah, us DevOps purists always are pounding the fist on the table, now virtual table, APIs and connectors. This is the, <laughs> this is the model, this is how people are integrating. And I want to get your thoughts on this. I think you said low code or no code on the developer simplicity side. Is it no code or low code? What, can you just explain quickly? And it's, clarify it's, the point? it's no code for, for, for getting started. Literally, you know, for the, for the kind of basic to medium complexity use case, it's, it's no code. And so, um, you know, in a lot of customers we spoke to, that was a bottleneck, right? They needed, they needed something from data. Um, it might've been the finance organization or it could have been, you know, human resources, somebody else in the organization needed that. They don't have a developer um, that helps them typically. And so we'd find that they would wait many, many months or maybe even never get the project done just because they never ever had access to that, that data or to the developer to actually do the work that was required for the transformation. And so it's no code for almost all use cases um, where it literally is select your data source, select the connector um, and then select the transformations. And you know, some basic transformations, renaming of fields, transformation of data in simple ways um, that's, that's more insufficient for the vast majority of use cases. And then obviously through to the destination um, with the connector on the other side to do the final transformation to the to the final data source that you want to migrate the data to. You know, you have an interesting background. I was looking at um, your history and you've essentially been a web services kind of guy all your life uh, from a code standpoint, software divine, um, yeah. software environment. And now obviously EC2 is the crown jewel of AWS and, and doing more and more with S3. But uh, what's interesting as you build more of these layered services in there, there's more flexibility. So right now in most of the customer environments is a debate around, do I build something monolithic and or decoupled? Okay, and I think there's a world where there's a mutually, they're not mutually exclusive anymore. You can have a mainframe, you can have a big monolithic thing if it does something, but generally people would agree that the, a decoupled environment is more flexible and more agile. So I want to kind of get to the customer use case because I can really see this being really powerful 
app flow with, with private link where you mentioned Snowflake. I mean, Snowflake is built on AWS. They're doing extremely, extremely well like any other company that builds on AWS, whether it's the Cube Cloud or a Snowflake. You know, we, as we tap those services customers, we might have people who want to build on our platform on top of AWS. So I, I know uh, a bunch of startups that are building on uh, within the Snowflake ecosystem, a customer of yeah. yours. So they're technically a customer of Amazon, but they're also in the ecosystem of say Snowflake. So yes. this brings up an interesting kind of computer science problem, which is architecturally, how do I think about that? Is this something where AppFlow could help me? Because I certainly want to enable people to build on a platform that I build if I'm doing that if I'm not going to be a pure SaaS turnkey application, but if I'm going to bring partners in and do integration, use the benefits of the goodness of an API or connector driven architecture, I need that. So explain to me how this helps me or doesn't help me. Is this something that makes sense to you? Does that, does it, does this question make sense? How do you react to that? I, th I think so. I think uh, the question is pretty broad, but I, I think there's, there's an element in which they can help. So firstly, you talk about sort of decoupled applications, right? Um, and I think that is, you know, certainly the way that that we've gone at Amazon and been very, very successful for us. You know, we I think we went we started that journey back in two thousand and three, when we decoupled the the monolithic application that was Amazon.com, uh, and that's when our service journey started. And a lot of that sort of inspired AWS and how we built what we built today. And we see a lot of our customers doing that, moving to smaller smaller applications. It just works better. It's it's you know easier to debug. Um, there's ownership at a at a very controlled level, so you can let all your engineering teams have very clear and crisp ownership. Um, and it, it just drives innovation, right? Because each little component can innovate without the the burden of the rest of the ecosystem. Uh, and so that's what we really enjoy. In, in terms of, I think the other thing that's important when you think about design is um, to see how much of the ecosystem you can leverage. And so whether you're building on Snowflake, or you're building directly on top of AWS, or you're building on top of one of our you know, uh, other customers and partners, if you can use something that solves the problem for you versus building it yourself, well, that just leaves you with more time to actually go and focus on the stuff that you need to be solving, right? The, the, the product you need to be building. Um, and so um, in, the, in the case of AppFlow, I think if there's a need for transfer of data um, you know, between, for example, Snowflake and some data warehouse that you as a as, as, a, as an organization are trying to build on, on the Snowflake and infrastructure, AppFlow is something you could potentially look at. Um, it's certainly not something that you could just use for, you know, it's, it's very specific and focused to the flow of data um, between services from a data analytics point of view. Um, it's not really something you could use you know, from an API point of view or messaging between services. Um, it's more really just facilitating that flow of data and the transformation of data um, to get it into a place that you can do something useful with it. And you said, um, yeah, but like any of our services, there's no reason I mean, it's a level of coding, couldn't be used think? any layer uh, in the stack. Yeah, so it's a, it's a level of integration, right? There's no code yeah. to code, <laughs> depending on how you look at it. Um, cool. Yeah. Um, customer use cases, you mentioned um, large scale analytics. I thought I heard you say uh, machine learning, data lakes. I mean, basically anyone who's using data is going to want to tap some sort of data repository and figure out how to scale data when appropriate. There's also contextual relevant data that might be specific to say an industry vertical or a database. And obviously AI becomes the application for all this. If I'm a customer, exactly. how does AppFlow relate to that? What, how does that help me and what's the bottom line? Yeah. So I think there's two parts to that journey and, and um, you know, depending on where customers are. And so there's, you know, we do have millions of customers today um, that are running applications on AWS over the last few years. You know, we've seen the emergence of data lakes, um, really just the storage of a large amount of data, typically in S3, um, that then companies want to extract value out of and use in certain ways. Um, obviously we have many, many tools today, um, you know, from Redshift, um, Athena, that allow you to you know, utilize these data lakes and be able to run queries against this information. Uh, things like EMR and one of our older services in the space. Um, and so doing some sort of large scale analytics. And more recently, you know, services like SageMaker are allowing us to do machine learning. And so being able to run machine learning across an enormous amount of data that we have stored um, in AWS. And there's some stuff in the IoT uh, workload use space as well that, that, that's, that's emerging. And, and, and many customers are using that today. Um, there's obviously many customers today that, that aren't using it on AWS, potential customers for us um, that are looking to do something useful with data. And so the one part of the journey is, you know, setting up all of that infrastructure. And we have a lot of services that make it really easy to do machine learning and do analytics and that sort of thing. And then, you know, then the other problem, the other side of the problem, which is what AppFlow is addressing is how do I get that data to S3 or to Redshift to actually go and run that machine learning workload? Um, and that's, that's what it's really unlocking for customers. And it's not just the, 
one-time transfer of data, the other thing that AppFlow actually supports is the continuous updating of data. And so if you decide that you want to have a, a, a view of your data in S3, for example, in a data lake, that's kept up to date, you know, within a few minutes or within an hour, you can actually configure App, AppFlow to do that. And so the data source could be Salesforce, it could be Slack, it could be whatever data source you want to want to pull in, and you continuously have that flow of data between those systems. And so when you go to run your machine learning workload or your analytics, it's all continuously up to date, and you, you don't have this problem of, you know, let me get the data, right? Uh, and, you know, when I think about some of the, the data jobs that I've run in my time as, you know, back in the day as an engineer on early EC2, um, you know, a small part of it was actually running the job on the data. A large part of it was how do I actually get that data and is it up to date? Yeah, up to um, date is critical. I think that's the big feature there is that this idea of having the data connectors really makes the data fresh because if you go through the modeling and you realize, well, I missed a big patch of data, the machine learning is not as exactly. Good. I mean, it's only the exactly. data. Um, and the other thing is it's very easy to bring in new data sources, right? Um, you think about how many companies today have an enormous amount of data just stored in silos and they haven't done anything with it. They may have, often it'll be, it'll be a conversation somewhere, right, around the around the coffee machine, hey, we could do this and we could do this, but um, they haven't had the developers to help them and, and they haven't had access to the data and they haven't been able to move the data and to put it in a useful place. And so I think, you know, what we're seeing here is with AppFlow really the unlocking of that because going from that initial conversation to actually having something running literally requires no code. Log into the AWS console configure a few, um, you know, connectors and, and it's up and running and you're ready to go. And you can do the same thing with SageMaker or any of the other services we have on the other side that make it really simple to run some of these, these ideas that just historically have been just too complicated. To okay, going. so take me through that console piece. Just walk me through, I'm in, you sold me on this. I just came at a meeting with my company and I said, hey, you know what? We're blowing up this siloed approach. We want to kind of create this horizontal data model where we can mix and match connectors based upon our needs. So, okay, yeah. what do I do? I, I'm using SageMaker, um, using some data, I got S3, I got an application. What, what do I do? I'm yeah. connecting what? S3 yeah, well, to the app? Yeah, so the, so, so the simplest thing is, and you know, the simplest place to find this actually uh, is on Jeff Barr's um, blog that he did for, for the release, right? Jeff always does a great job in demonstrating how to use our various products. Um, but it literally is going into the standard AWS console, um, you know, which is which is uh, the console that we use for all of our services. Um, I think we have 200 of them. So it is getting kind of challenging to find them all in that console as we continue to grow. Um, and find AppFlow. Now, AppFlow is, is a top level um, service. And so you'll see it in the console. Um, and, and the first thing you got to do is you got to configure your source connect. And so there's a connector that, you know, where, where's the data coming from? Um, and as I said, we had 14 partners. You'll be able to see those connectors there and see what's what's supported. Um, and obviously there's the connectivity. Um, you know, do you have access to that data? Or where is that data running? Um, AppFlow runs within AWS. And so you would need to have either VPN or Direct Connect um, back to your organization if, if the data source is on-premise. If the data source happens to be in AWS, it'll obviously be in a VPC. And you just need to configure some of that connectivity functionality. So no code um, if the connectors are there, but what if I want to build my own connector? Uh, so building your own connector, uh, that is something that we're working with third party part, uh, parties with right now. Um, I, I could be corrected, but I'm not 100% sure whether that's available. That's certainly something I think we would allow customers to do, um, is to extend sort of either the existing connectors or to add additional transformations as well. Um, and so you'd be able to do that. Um, but the transformations that the vast majority of our customers are using are literally just in the console with you basic. Take some of the bigger apps that people have and just building those connectors. How does a yeah. partner get involved? You got 14 partners now. How do you extend the partner base? Contact an Amazon partner manager, or you send an email to someone. How does someone get involved? What's the what are you what are you recommending? So there are a couple of ways, right? Um, you know, we have an extensive partner ecosystem that the vast majority of these um, ISVs are already uh, integrated with, and so we have you know, we have the 14 we launched with. Um, we also pre-announced SAP, um, which is going to be a very critical one for the vast majority of our customers. Um, having deep integration with SAP data and being able to bring that seamlessly into AWS, that'll be that'll be launching soon. And then there's a long list of other ones that we're currently working on, uh, and they're currently working on them themselves. Um, and then you know the other one is going to be, like with most things at Amazon, feedback from customers. And um, so what we you know what we hear from customers, and very often we'll hear from third-party partners as well, who come and say, hey, my customers are asking me. To integrate with AppFlow, what do I need to do? Yeah. And so, you know, just reaching out to AWS um, and uh, letting them know that you'd be interested in integrating. If you're not part of the partner program, um, you know, the team would be happy to uh, engage and bring you on board. So, Classic um, it's really Amazon good. playbook, get the top use cases nailed down, listen to customers and figure it out. Great stuff, exactly. David, yeah. really appreciate it. I'm looking forward to digging in AppFlow and I'll check on Jeff Barr's blog. 
Uh, I'm sure it's April 22nd was the launch day, probably had it up there. Um, one of the things yeah. I want to just jump into now, moving to the next topic is the cost structure. A lot of peak pressure on costs. This is where I think this migration acceleration program for Windows is interesting. You know, Andy Jassy always likes to boast on stage at reInvent um, about the number of workloads of Windows running on Amazon Web Services. Um, this has been a big part of the customers, I think for over 10 years, I think that I can think of him talking about this. Um, what is this about? Because you're, you're, are you still seeing uptake on Windows workloads or? Oh, absolutely. I mean, Azure's got absolutely. market That's share, but now you, you it's, it doesn't really kind of square in my mind <laughs> what's going on here. Um, tell us about this you, migration service. Yeah, absolutely, on the migration side. So Windows is, is absolutely, you know, we still believe AWS is the best place to run a Windows workload. Um, and we have many, many happy um, Windows customers today. And it's, it's, it's a, it's a gr very big, very large growing part of our business today. It used to be, um, you know, I was part of the original team back in 2008 um, that launched, um, I think it was uh, Windows 2008 back then uh, on, on EC2. Uh, and I remember, I remember sort of working out all the details of how to do all the virtualization with Windows. Obviously, you know, back then we'd done Linux um, and uh, getting Windows up and running and working through some of the, some of the challenges that, that, that Windows had as an operation, operating system in the, in the early days. Um, and it was October, 2008, that we actually launched Windows as an operating system. And it's just been, you know, we've had many, many happy Windows customers since then. Um, Why is Amazon so um, peaked to run workloads from Windows so effectively? Uh, well, I think, uh, sorry, did you say peaked? Why, you know, why is Amazon so in well positioned to run the Windows oh. workloads? Well, 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 firstly, I mean, I think, you know, uh, Windows is really just the operating system, right? And so if you think about that as the, the very last little bit um, of your sort of virtualization stack and, and then being able to support your applications, what you really have to think about is everything below that, um, both in terms of the compute. Um, so, you know, the performance you're going to get, the price performance you're going to get, you know, with our Nitro hypervisor and the Nitro system that we developed back in 2018 or launched in 2018, um, we really are able to provide, provide you with the best price performance um, you know, and, and have the very least overhead from a hypervisor point of view. And then what, mean, what that means is you're getting more out of your machine um, for the price that you pay. Um, and then you think about the rest of the ecosystem, right? You think about all the other services and all the features and just the, the breadth and the, the extensiveness of AWS. And that, that's critically important for all of our Windows customers as well. And so you're going to have your things like Active Directory and all those sort of things that are very Windows specific, and we can absolutely support all of those. Um, as you know, natively, um, and then the Windows operating system as well. You know, we have things like our um, various agents that you can run inside the Windows box to do more maintenance and management. Um, and so, I think we've done a really good job in in bringing Windows into the larger and broader ecosystem of AWS. Um, and, and really, it's just a case of making sure that you know uh, Windows runs uh, runs smoothly. And that's just the last little bit on top of that. And so, um, you know, many customers, enterprises run Windows today. Um, you know. When I started out my career, I was developing software in the, in the banking industry, and, and it was a very much a Windows uh, you know, environment um, where they were running critical applications. And so we see it critically important for customers who run Windows today to be able to bring those Windows workloads to AWS. Yeah, um, we are there. seeing a trend. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Well, they're certainly out there from a market share standpoint, but this is a cost driver. You guys are saying, and I want you to just give an example or just illustrate why it costs less. How is it a cost savings? Is it just, um, S services, cycle times on EC2. I mean, what's the cost savings? So I'm a customer like, okay, so I'm, I'm going to go to Amazon with my workloads. What's the, why is it a cost? I think there, there are a few things. The one I was referring to in, in my previous comment was um, the price performance, right? And so if, if I'm running on a system where the hypervisor is using a significant portion of the, of the physical CPU that I want to use as well, um, well, there's an overhead to that. And so from a price performance point of view, if I look at if I go and benchmark a CPU and I look at how much I pay for that, you know, per per unit of that benchmark, um, it's better on AWS um, because we, with our Nitro system, we're able to give you 100% of that pool, um, and so you get a performance there. And so that's the first thing is price performance, um, which is different from list price, um, but there's a saving there as well. The other one is, you know, a large part and, and getting into the migration program as well. A large part of what we do with our customers when they come to AWS is is first to we look we take a long look at their license strategy. What licenses do they have? Um, and a key part of bringing a Windows workload to AWS is license optimization. What can we do to help you optimize the licenses that you're using today um, for Windows, for SQL Server, um, and really try and find efficiencies in that? And so we're able to secure significant savings for many of our customers by doing that. Um, we have a number of tools that they use as part of the migration program to do that. Um, 
And uh, so, so that helps save there. And then, and then finally, um, you know, we have a lot of customers doing um, what we call modernization of their applications. And so you know, really embrace cloud um, and some of the benefits that you get from cloud, um, especially the elasticity, so being able to scale for demand. It's very difficult to do that when you're bound by a license for your operating system, because every box you run, you have to have a license for it. And so, you know, turning order scaling on, you've got to make sure you have enough licenses for all these Windows boxes you, you're seeing. And so the, 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 the push the cloud's bringing, we've seen a lot of customers move uh, Windows applications uh, from Windows to Linux, um, or even move SQL Server from SQL Server um, to SQL Server on Linux. And so do a, do a, or, or another database platform and, and do a modernization there um, that already allows them to, to benefit from the elasticity that cloud provides without having to constantly worry about licenses. So final question on this point, um, a migration service implies migration from somewhere else. How do they get involved? What's the onboarding process? Can you just give a quick uh, detail on that? Absolutely, so, so we've, uh, you know, we've been helping customers with migrations for years. Um, we launched the migration program, uh, the mig migration acceleration program map. Um, we launched it, I think about 2016, 2017 was the first part of that. And it was really just a bringing together of the various um, the, the, the things we'd learned, the tools we built, um, the best strategies to do a migration. And we said, how do we help customers looking to migrate to the cloud? And um, so that was, that's what MAP's all about, is just a three phase. We'll help you assess the migration. We'll help you do a whole lot of planning. Um, and then ultimately we help you actually do the migration. Um, we partner with a number of external um, partners and, and ISVs and uh, GSIs um, who also very, work very closely with us to help customers do migrations. And so what we launched in April of this year with the Windows migration um, program is really just more support for a Windows workload as part of the broader migration acceleration program. Um, and, uh, you know, there's benefits to customers. It's a smoother migration. It's a faster migration in, in, in almost all cases. Um, they, let, they land, you know, we're doing license assessment. And so there's cost reduction in that as well. Um, and ultimately, you know, there's, there's other benefits as well that we, we, we offer them uh, if they partner with us in bringing their workload to AWS. And so getting involved is really just, you know, reaching out to one of our AWS sales uh, folks or one of your account managers, if you have an account manager, um, and talking to them about workloads that you'd like to bring. And we even go as far as helping you identify which applications are easiest to migrate um, and so that you can kind of get going with some of the easier ones while we help you with some of the more difficult ones. Um, and it's really just about removing those low roadblocks to bring your services to AWS. Takes the blockers away. Uh, Dave Brown, Vice President of EC2, the crown jewel of AWS, breaking down app flow and the migration to Windows services. Great insights, appreciate the time. We're here with Great. Dan Brown, uh, VP of um, EC2, as part of the virtual cube coverage. Uh, Dave, I want to get your thoughts on um, an industry topic. Um, given what you've done with EC2 and the success and with COVID-19, you're seeing the at scale problem play out on the world stage for the entire population of the global uh, world. This is now turning non-believers into believers of DevOps, web services, real time. I mean, this is now a moment in history with the challenges that we have, even when we come out of this, whether it's six months or 12 months, the world won't be the same. And I believe that there's going to be a Cambrian explosion of applications in an architecture that's going to look a lot like cloud, cloud native. You've been doing yeah. this for many, many years key architect of EC2 with your team. How do you see this playing out? Because a lot of people are going to be squirreling in rooms when this, is when this comes back. They're going to be video conferencing now, but when they have meetings, they're going to look at the, the window of the future and they're going to be exposed to what's failed and saying, we need to double down on that. We have to fix this. So there's going to be winners and losers coming out of this pandemic really quickly. And I think this is going to be a major opportunity for everyone to rally around this moment to reset and I think it's going to look a lot like this decoupled, this distributed computing environment, leveraging all the things that we've talked about in the past. So what's your advice and how do you see this evolving? Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, I think, um, you know, just, just the speed at which it happened as well um, and the way in which organizations, uh, both internally and externally, had to reinvent themselves very, very quickly, right? Um, you know, we've been very fortunate within Amazon, um, you know, moving to working from home was relatively simple for the vast majority of us. Obviously we have a number of our, our employees that, that you know, work in data centers and performance centers that, that you know, have been on the front lines um, and been doing a great job. But um, you know, for, for the rest of us, it's been vi you know, virtual video conferencing, right? Uh, all of our meetings and being able to use all of our networking tools um, securely either over the VPN or the no VPN infrastructure that we have. And, and many organizations had to do that. And so I think um, there are a number of different things that have impacted us right now. Um, you know, obviously, um, virtual desktops has been has been a significant uh, 
sort of growth point, right? If folks don't have access to their physical machine anymore, um, they're now all having to work remote. And so um, a service like Workspaces, which runs on EC2 as well, um, has been a critical service there to support many of our largest customers. Um, our client VPN service that we have within EC2 on the networking side has also been uh, critical for many large organizations as they see more of their staff working every day remotely, um, as, as also seen, you know, being able to support a lot of customers there. Um, just, just more broadly, um, you know, what we've seen with COVID-19 is, is we've seen uh, some industries uh, really struggle. Obviously, the travel industry, um, you know, it, people just aren't traveling anymore. Uh, and and uh, so, so there's been there's been an immediate impact to some of those in, industries. There have been other industries that support functions, um, you know, like like the video conferencing uh, or entertainment side of the house has, has, has seen a bit of growth um, over the last couple of months. And, um, you know, education has been an interesting one for us as well, where schools have been moving online. Um, and, uh, you know, behind the scenes in AWS, we've... Um, and on EC2, we've been working really hard to make sure that our supply chains are not interrupted in any way. Um, the last thing we want to do is have any of our customers not be able to get EC2 capacity um, when they desperately need it. And so, um, you know, we've made sure that capacity is fully available, uh, even all the way through the pandemic. Um, and we've even built, been able to support customers with, uh, you know, I remember one customer who told me that next day they're going to have, uh, there's more than 100,000 students coming online. Um, and they suddenly did grow their business, uh, you know, by some crazy number. Um, and we were able to support them and give them that capacity, which was way outside of any sort of demand signal. I think this is the Cambrian explosion that I was referring to because a whole new set of new things have emerged. New, uh, new gaps in business have been exposed. New opportunities are emerging. This is about agility. It's real time now. It's actually happening for everybody, not just the folks on the inside of the industry. This is going to create a reinvention. So it's ironic. I've heard the word reinvent mentioned more <laughs> times now over the past three months than I've heard it re represent to Amazon because that's your annual conference yeah. reinvent, but people are resetting and reinventing. It's actually Absolutely. a tactic. This is going on. So they're going to need some cloud. So what do you, what do you say to that? So, I, I mean, the first thing is making sure that we can continue to be highly available uh, and continue to have the capacity. The, the worst scenario is not being able to have the capacity for our customers, right? Um, we, we did see that with some providers, um, you know, just, and, and that honesty on our side is just years and years of experience of being able to manage supply chain. Uh, and, and the second thing uh, is obviously making sure that, that we're, um, we remain available, um, that we don't have issues. And so, you know, with all of our staff going, going um, remote and working from home, all my teams are working from home, um, being able to support AWS in this environment has been, you know, we haven't missed a beat there, um, which has been really good. We were well set up to be able to absorb this. Um, and then obviously re remaining secure, which is always our highest priority. Um, yeah. And then, you know, innovating with our customers and being able to, and, and that's both, you know, products that we're going to launch over time. Um, but in many cases, like, you know, that, that, that education scenario I was talking about, that's being able to find that capacity yeah. in multiple regions around the world, literally on a Sunday night, um, because they found out literally that afternoon, that Monday morning, all schools were virtual and they were going to use their platform. Yeah. Um, and so being able to respond to that demand, um, you know, we've seen, we've seen a lot more um, machine learning workload. We've seen an increase there as well as organizations um, are running more models, um, both within the health sciences uh, area, um, but also in the financial areas and also in just general business, right? Oil and gas, wherever it might be, everybody's trying to respond to what is the impact of this and better understand it. And so machine learning is helping there. And so being able to support all those workloads. And so there's been an explosion. With, work. I was joking uh, with my, my son. I said, you know, this world is interesting. But Amazon really wins and stuff's getting delivered to my house and I want to play video games and Twitch and I want to build <laughs> applications and write software. All I could do that all in my home. So you win all around. Uh, but you know, all kidding aside, this is an, an opportunity to, to define agility. So I want to get your thoughts because I'm a bit of a big fan of Amazon. As everyone knows, I'm kind of a, a pro Amazon person. And as other clouds kind of try to level up, they're, they're moving in the same direction, which is good for everybody, good competition yeah. and all. But S3 and EC2 have been the crown jewels and building more services around those and creating these abstraction layers and new sets of service to make it easier, I know has been a top priority for AWS. So can you share your vision on how you're going to make EC2 and all these services easier <laughs> for me? So if I'm a coder, I want literally no code, low code, infrastructure as code. I need to make Amazon more programmable and easier. Can you just share your vision on, as we talk about the virtual summits, as we cover the show, What's your take on making Amazon easier to consume and use? You know, we've, uh, it, it's been something we thought a lot over the years, right? When we started out, we were very simple. Um, the early days of EC2, it, was, it, weren't, it wasn't that rich feature set. Um, and it's been an interesting journey for us. Um, you know, we've obviously um, 
we've 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 become a lot more uh, we've launched a lot more features which which inherently brings um, some more complexity to the platform um we have launched things like lightsail over the years um lightsail is a kind of hosting environment that gives you um that ec2 like experience but but it's a lot simpler and it's also integrated with a number of other services like rds and you know, elb as well um give you basic load balancing functionality um and and we've seen some really good growth there um, but what we've also learned is is customers enjoy the richness um, of what EC2 provides um, and what the full ecosystem provides and being able to use you know, the pieces that they really need to build their application. Um, the, uh, from, from, a, you know, from an S3 point of view, from a more broad ecosystem point of view, um, you know, uh, it's, it's providing customers with the features and functionality that they really need um, to be successful. Um, so, so we haven't, uh, from, from a, we've, on the compute side of the house, we've, we've, we've done some things, obviously containers have really taken off and there's a lot of frameworks, whether it's, um, EKS or, you know, Elastic uh, Kubernetes Service or our, our Docker-based ECS that's made that a lot simpler for developers. Um, and then obviously, uh, you know, in the serverless space, Lambda is, um, a great way of consuming EC2, right? Um, I know it's serverless, but there's still an EC2 instance under the hood, uh, and, uh, being able to just bring a basic function and run those functions in serverless is, 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 you know, a lot of customers are enjoying that. Yeah. Um, you know, the other complexity we're going after is, is on the networking side of the house. Um, I find that a lot of developers out there, they're, they're more than happy to write the code. They're more than happy to bring their application to AWS. But they they struggle a little bit more on the networking side. They really do not want to have to worry about whether they have a route uh, to an internet gateway uh, and if the subnets defined correctly to actually make the application work. And so, um, you know, we, we have services like App Mesh and the whole mesh service space is developing a lot um, to really make that a lot simpler, where you can just bring your application and call another an application that just uses service discovery. Um, and so those 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 higher level services are definitely helping. In terms of no code, you know, I think. Um, App Mesh is is sorry not uh, App, App Mesh App Flow is is one of the examples where we've really given uh, organizations something at that level that says I can do something with no code. Um, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of work happening in other areas. Uh, it's it's not something I'm I'm actively thinking on right now in my role at EC, leading EC2. Yeah. Um, but I'm sure you know as the use cases come from customers, I'm sure you'll see more from us in those areas. Um, they'll likely be more specific though, because as soon as you take code out of the picture. Um, you know, you're going to have to get pretty specific in the use case uh, to really get the depth and the functionality that customers will need. Well, it's been super awesome to have your valuable time here on the virtual cube for covering Amazon Summit, virtual digital event that, that's going on. And will be going on throughout the year. Really appreciate the insight. And I think, you know, it's right on the money. I think the world is going to have a um, six to 12 month surge in, in reset, re reinventing and growing. So I think a lot of companies who are smart are going to reset reinvent and set a new growth trajectory because it's a cloud native world, it's cloud computing. This is now a reality and I think there's proof points now. So the whole world's experiencing it, not just the insiders and the industry and it's, it's going to be an interesting time. So uh, really appreciate that. They appreciate it. Great. Thank, them coming on. Thank you very much for having me. It's been good. I'm John Furrier here inside the Cube Virtual, our virtual Cube coverage of AWS Summit 2020, we're going to have ongoing Amazon Summit Virtual Cube. We can't be on the show floor, so we'll be on the virtual show floor covering and talking to the people behind the stories and, of course, the most important stories in SiliconANGLE and theCUBE.net. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.